On this episode of Dion Extend, we discuss what we see as some problems in KDE Plasma. This episode of Dion Extend is brought to you by DigitalOcean and Bitward. Welcome to episode 74 of DLN Extend. DLN Extend is a community-powered podcast. We take conversations from the DLN community, from places like the DLN discourse forums, telegram groups, discord server, and more. We also take topics from other shows around the network and give our takes. And with me are the fine, fantastic co-host of mine, Nate, the unhealthily obsessed person with OpenSUSE, and Wendy, the photographer extraordinaire. What's going on, guys? Almost. Almost unhealthy. You, know, you keep getting this mixed up a little bit, but it's almost. That's my tagline. And I almost got you to say correct. That's neither here nor there. I'm just saying. It's not unhealthy entirely. It's almost. No, it's totally. Every once in a while, we can get him to slip up. I know we've got (laughs) image proof now of one of those little slip ups on Big Daddy Linux from this last show. We even have audio proof from one of the episodes too. So Those are slips though. They're not genuine. It's kind of like saying, actually, I don't have an example. On the positive side, I found my OpenSUSE plushie yesterday, and so I'm really excited about that. I can hold it as we talk with a camera off, of course, so you can't see me doing that. Seeing how you found your OpenSUSE plushie, thanks for the update on that. What about (laughs) some updating of some school stuff? Oh, yeah, of course. I've been updating the kids' computers in preparation for school, because school started back up this week. Last week, I was doing preparation for it. They they all run OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. Two of the netbooks are running XFCE because this plasma is a little bit hard on them. We'll get to that later. And then the other one is running Plasma, a larger idea pad. And after having not been updated since March, they all seemingly updated just fine. They're being utilized by the kids for their additional schoolwork, like typing, and then doing some other like drills and whatnot using uh, the G Compress. I had one netbook. It kept timing out for whatever reason. It kept having like these segmentation faults. It might have been a zipper thing. I don't really know. I had to restart the update a few times. But outside of that, actually, everything went, went great. Kids are using them, they're dropping them, and they're still chugging away. So that was the big push for me. It's a little bit of an open SUSE smile of mine. I can be negligent on my Tumbleweed computers for, oh, what, three, four months. They update, and I can just keep rolling with them. That's awesome. It's nice to have systems that you can just put away for the summer and not have to worry about them until the next school year. For sure. So Wendy, I understand uh, you've been having some mouse issues. To be honest, I've been having all kinds of issues as we've talked about pre-show and post-show and post-first show. This is second extent, (laughs) 74. We've had all kinds of issues lately, but yes, I had mouse issues as well. I couldn't figure out what was going on with it. First, I thought it was maybe a setting in Piper, so I changed some settings in Piper. That didn't work. It was really stuttery and glitchy, so I'd go to highlight something and it would unhighlight and highlight something else, or I mean, just having all kinds of these really weird issues, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. I had looked up some possible issues. I'd run some terminal commands trying to see if there was additional settings that maybe weren't being changed properly when I was changing them in Piper to try to see if that was the issue. No, everything there looked good. I went ahead and reset them anyway, but still couldn't figure it out. I changed. USB ports and it was still being glitchy and I'd reached the point that I needed to get the show edited and my stupid mouse wasn't working and I got a little frustrated and I gave it a love tap on the desk and that fixed it. Okay, maybe like three. So when you say love tap, do you mean like a nice like little tap tap or was it more of a I love you forcefully kind of a tap? It was very forcefully. It was one of those that <laughs> either you're broken or I'm going to make sure you're broken. Right. And it actually actually corrected the problem. I don't know if there was an issue like maybe with the sensor. I don't know. Magneto's first go-to thing for technology to just throw it was actually (laughs) the best option this time, though we did have a discussion of that shouldn't be the first option. Just because his first option worked on the mouse this time doesn't mean it's always the best option for technology. That's what they call in the business the Fonzarelli trick. When he would bump the jukebox and it would start working again, that's kind of what you did. He did a little Fonzarelli trick on your mouse. Yes. Been working ever since. So I don't know if we just had a miscommunication and finally it's like, okay, 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 I'll do my job. Or what? (laughs) But it's working fine now. Apparently you are learning to take after your husband, Wendy, as far as (laughs) don't do that with the technology, it'll break. Well, uh, apparently by doing what you did, it fixed it for (laughs) once. Maybe starting to absorb Magneto's superpower of how he fixes technology. After 16 years of being together, there is some kind of crossover between mannerisms. Maybe that is one thing I've picked up after being together that long. (laughs) My mouse is finally working, the show got out, and you're still organizing there, Matt. Yeah, I was 
was organizing my physical game collection last episode. This time I went through the digital one. So I went through Steam and oof, that's going to take a while. <laughs> Because generically, I have a few different categories I organize that stuff in. I have like a multiplayer segment. I have what I call no end game, which is like those civilization type games. Then I have games that I've completed. And then I have the generic unorganized or uncategorized list in Steam. And whew, that one, that's rough because that's a lot of games to go through. Is that a growing list or is it tapered off this year still? You haven't exactly been good on your commitment to not buy new games this year. <laughs> yeah, well, I made it until about what, July? You made a half the year. I thought it was February. He's bought games for other people, but he didn't buy any for himself until July. Yes, that is correct. However you want to shape that lie to make yourself sleep better, that's cool. Says the guy with the unhealthy obsession with open Sousa. Almost. Keep telling yourself that. It reminds me of why I generically hate organizing my game stuff because it just takes way too long. I don't miss doing it, but unfortunately, it's one of those things like uh, when you get almost a thousand plus games, it's kind of time to organize the library as it would be. It sounds like fun. Actually, it doesn't sound like fun. Is that something you can do on your phone? Uh, No, it's not. Well, actually, honestly, I don't know if I'd want to do it from the Steam app anyway. The UI on the Steam app is not the best, shall we say, ironically enough. Yeah, it's not fun at all. Not going to lie, but I got to do it because if I don't, I'm never going to actually whittle down this list of uncategorized stuff that is just sitting in my library. So you almost sound like playing games is a job for you. I've got to get through all of these games. And so I need to do some organization so I can get to the next project on the list. Yes, I just checked my list (laughs) and I have 22 Steam games total. That's what I got for me to get through my organization. I have favorites and uncategorized and that's it. I think. (laughs) I've got more than that. I'm not exactly sure how many Steam games I have. It's opening right now so I can check. And I know that there's a lot of games that I haven't played. On the kids Steam account, they actually have a lot more games too, but there was a Humble Bundle that had an absolute ton of those like 90s kids games. The one with like the fish or the twins that had blue hair. And I can't remember the end name of any of those games. So there's a bunch of them on there. I think my youngest has played them like once or twice. It was one of those bundles that I probably actually could have done without because they haven't been too interested in them. Okay, so I've got my library pulled up and it says total, I have 148 games. And of course, some of those have been bought through Humble Bundles and they are 64 installed right now. You had me at 90s games. Maybe there's something wrong with me. They were fun games. They were games that my youngest brother played that I remember seeing him play when he was little. So it was like something about Fred the fish and yeah I have to look it up but we do have a bunch of those games that I got on a humble bundle here about a year maybe a year and a half ago it sounds like fun but that's just me at the apple 2 math munchers was fun I'd never played that one but we didn't have an apple around the house my first exposure to an apple computer was high school oh really the UI hasn't changed in the last decade since next step got bought you haven't missed much they want to say the Linux goes slow uh well mac UI goes a whole lot slower It's working for them, I guess. I know. It's always fun to poke at the other platforms. This episode of Deal and Extend is brought to you by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean recently announced their new managed MongoDB service, which is a fully managed database as a service. With MongoDB, you can focus more on building scalable, high-performance apps and less on maintaining the database. Simply offload your MongoDB administration to DigitalOcean and let them handle the provisioning, managing, scaling, updates, backups, and security for your clusters. DigitalOcean built this service in partnership with MongoDB Inc. And together, they have ensured that you will get access to all the latest releases of MongoDB document database as they become available. As a listener of DLN Extend podcast and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for free. Actually, better than free because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 credit when you go to do.co slash DLN dash Mongo. Again, go to do.co slash DLN dash M-O-N-G-O and get started with your $100 free credit on DigitalOcean's new Manage Mongo DB. We want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of DLN Extend. 
Speaking of poking fun at the other platforms, we poked at GNOME last episode. So this one, we're going to take a look at Kitty Plasma. And it's not all love from all the Plasma users that are on this show, which I'm going to find interesting to hear what some of your guys' takes on. I don't want to call them deficiency. Some of the Plasma's problem. We all look at things differently as far as what we view as problems. Just like we did with GNOME, we'll look at Plasma and some of our irritations with it, shall we say. Well, I can kick it off. I did talk about just a little bit ago, the kids' computers, two of them running XFCE, another one running Plasma. Now, the reason two of them are running XFCE is because the display manager, SDDM, does not play well with old machines with weak GPUs. It seems like there'd be some sort of a built-in check or something on how new the GPU is or how performant it is before it does all those effects just on the login. This is just me. There really isn't much need for eye candy on the display manager. Maybe I'm just an old curmudgeon, but I feel like that is a shortcoming of Plasma and why I can't use it on some machines. And it's probably one of those reasons it gets a uh, rap for being resource heavy, especially if you're loading it on an older machine. It may not be the best option for that machine just because of some of the extra, as you would call it, eye candy gets tossed in there. Now, some of that can be turned off, but you have to actually get into the desktop and get into the settings in order to be able to turn off a lot of those extra effects. And when you're just trying to boot for the first time, that's definitely frustrating as it's all moving way too slow. Right. And it's bad enough that it makes it unusable. Even like the lock screen, it uses the display manager for that as well. You tap the touchpad, you know, hit a mouse button, whatever, hit a key, and you wait for an inordinate number of seconds just to be able to get in there. And we're talking like 10 plus seconds just for it to finishing what it's got to do. It's very aggravating. I'm not a fan of SDDM by default for older machines. Yeah, absolutely. It works fine for your newer machines. Even the machines that I have the kids on at school it's running Ubuntu right now and they seem to be doing just fine with it but each one has at least an i3 in it. They are made to be a touchscreen machine with Wacom built in so they've got the graphics pen and they seem to be handling it without any issues, without any stutters that way. But that is probably because of the way these machines were built and the purpose that they were built for. If they're eight or nine year old machine, it's probably still just fine. But you know, when you're pushing 10, 11 years old, that's really where the problem comes in. Yeah. One of the biggest issues I have is when yeah, I'm testing it out, something of course with plasma on it, but testing it a new spin of it somewhere and that single click is still default that I know the Plasma team thinks that it should be. That's what they all use. So that's what they want the default to be. But most of people, even though I'm sure we'll have a single click versus double click war, I will be with double click all the way through. You can't change my mind, especially highlighting multiple pictures. It is really frustrating when I'm trying to highlight a group of pictures or instead of highlighting the picture so I can highlight more or different files and stuff. I move things around all of the time graphically inside Dolphin and it's opening stuff instead of allowing me to highlight stuff so I can select everything I need instead of just the one thing. Oh, but Wendy. Manjaro has made it so single click isn't. Yes. You have the little add remove plus minus ghost icon that appears when your mouse hovers over it. Sure, that's basically not an option for touchscreen, but it's there for mouse users. Well, I'm there <laughs> with a mouse working on it. You have to realize that it's there for one and then you have have to be accustomed to single click for that to even work. I'm usually in a hurry. Single click just doesn't work well for me. Just highlight everything I want with a quick tap regardless whether it's over that special icon or not. Single click is not for me. Single click is not for the majority of users so it would make a better default for double click to be the default and single click to not be. But Manjaro has made it so double click is the default. Michael has talked to Kubuntu made it so that double click is the default there. There are some distributions that have changed that, but directly from Plasma, if you were to get something just plain Jane, it will be that single click option. Single click is the devil spawn. I don't know if I'd go that far. <laughs> and it's one of those things that can be frustrated to find in settings, especially if you're not used to how the settings are laid out in Plasma. It can be a little frustrating to find where some of these settings are. It seems to have gotten better 
said over over the last few iterations. But if you're looking for something specific, as you're looking down the list, it could be in a lot of places because there's several logical places to put some of these settings. And some of them where I'm like, okay, I don't really understand why that's there, but fine. The search feature is about the best way to go when looking for some of those settings. I do not want my screen to turn off every five minutes and me to unlock it when I've walked away. I know it's a security feature to keep what you've got going on on your computer safe. It's a laptop and it's out and about. I'm home. I don't need my computer screen to lock on me every five minutes. I have kids that already interrupt me that often and then to like deal with the child thing and get back to my computer and then that extra, I know it doesn't take that long, but that extra few seconds just to get the computer screen unlocked, that's another thing that I'm like, why Why is this a base setting? If you need that extra security, turn it on. I, I don't know. Maybe that's just me as the frustrations of some of the things that I have to change. And that's even on Manjaro. But some of the things that I have to change every time I start up a new system, for the most part, I keep Plasma the way Manjaro gives it to me. There's not too much that I change in the way of settings, but I know that is definitely one of them. I have to go in and change the time management settings, the edit with say like power resources or that kind of things for it. Because even on my laptops, I don't want them to shut down every five seconds. If I'm taking them with me somewhere, I don't just leave them on a desk, especially now where I pack the Microsoft Surface Pro 6 with me. If I get up, it gets up and leaves with me. I'm not leaving it (laughs) sitting anywhere. Right. What you're talking about, Wendy, is like that power management. If I'm going to walk away and I want to secure my system and not have the system do it, which I would prefer not to because it's over aggressive, I will use the meta and L key or, you know, whatever key combination it requires to lock the system. At that point, I definitely get that frustration. When you install like a KDE Neon or like anything that is straight plasma as far as the desktop, that theme, that bright white blind burning sun in your eyes if you work at night theme hurts my eyes to no end. Oh, for sure. The only distro that besides the ones that implement a dark theme by default, I have found that if you're going to have a compromise of the light theme with the dark theme, it's probably Kubuntu with Twilight. There's enough visual difference where it's it doesn't feel like your eyes are going to get seared out of the back of your head. <laughs> yeah, that's a good balance that should be looked at more than has been by the KDE Plasma guys, because I know in your case, those white themes give you headaches. I know for me, it's just I can't work with that because those whites are just too bright for me in general. So yeah, the Twilight theme is fine until you've got a room full of kids with computers on and you ask them to open Kate and (laughs) things are dark but Kate is still fluorescent white and you need to go and check (laughs) formatting for HTML. That is probably one of the bigger things that doesn't ever really get looked at. I like the breeze overall look and feel. That generic light theme. uh, Can that kind of go please? (laughs) Because it hurts. I agree. I think Twilight is a good compromise but for me dark theme should be the only theme because if it's too bright it just hurts and I can't be on a computer for an extended period of time working with such brightness in my eyes it just makes it uncomfortable and unenjoyable really yeah definitely it does but that's one of the things we talked about last week where not all of us have eyes that are as sensitive as the three of us do but it is definitely one of those features that is an accessibility feature and i'm so glad i know we're talking about bad things about plasma i know i praised it last time but this is one of those things that i do absolutely love about them and one of the reasons why unless it goes away or they do something else that it's really annoying. I'll be a Plasma user forever just because of that really good global dark theme. There are some hangups sometimes when it does come to that global dark theme and LibreOffice is one of them and you have to make a changes when you go in. So it'll get that overall arching global dark theme, except for in the icons. You have to go in and specifically change that so that you can see what you're doing inside of those. And that's another one of those settings that can be kind of a pain in the butt to find. I usually don't use the office products too much, but as co-op is starting back up, I'm getting a list of students 
that are in my class, contact information for them and parents. We can all talk back and forth the stuff that's going on with class and being able to send messages, emails, that kind of thing. So I'll get something for Calc, for LibreOffice. And yeah, there's my list. I can see everything fine. But if I need to edit that list, because I've got the global dark theme, it's dark, but the icons are dark and you have to go in and manually change that. I'm going to pull it up really quick. So if there's any of you that are dealing with the same issue or thinking about having a global dark theme, the way that you change that was, now I probably won't be able to find it again. It's under tools, options, and under LibreOffice, it's view. And then icon style, I have to choose breeze dark. Yes, there you go. Nate is a pro and he found it way faster because there's other options in there where it comes to personalization and color. Well, well, not a pro. Well, you're definitely faster at it than me. Season novice. Let's go with season novice for me on that. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so that makes it so you can actually see all the icons that are across the top, be able to read them. Whereas before you have this great looking dark gray background and then the icons are all just slightly lighter than that. So you almost have to do the squint thing to try and figure out what? What is that icon? So unless you have it memorized, you have to be able to change that setting. Not all applications you need to make changes. Some are better at adapting to that global theme than others, but I figure it's one of those smaller prices to pay. Yeah, it would be nice if it seamlessly changed across everything and you didn't have to make any additional changes, but at least LibreOffice knows that that's an issue and they allow you to be able to change that if you can find the setting. So thank you, Nate. That's where the settings at. No problem. Now, one of the issues that I have with Plasma by default now, I know everyone says, oh, Plasma 5 is so great, so much better than 4, so much better than KDE 3. And overall, I would say, yes, that's true. But the regional time setting piece of Plasma 5 basically annoys the crap out of me up until recently when I figured out that you can change the default date time by going into the regional settings and saying uh, and customize and then the drop down to default C for the time so that it actually shows in 24 hour clock. I do not like AM PM. AM PM does not work for me whatsoever. Uh, it's confusing. I know I'm like, I'm probably the only one that has that problem, but nonetheless, it is still a problem for me. That's probably a holdover from military, right? Those yes, army days. it is. Well, actually, I liked it before the military. I was a little bit of a strange duck in that regard. And Plasma 3 and 4, or KDE 3 and Plasma 4, you could actually go in and specifically specify how you want the date to look. And it just happens to be that I'm fine with the default C because it's very clean looking. But if I wasn't happy with it, I'd still be very irritated. Yeah, I know that there's some systems that have been a little frustrating and I don't know whether it's Plasma itself or something that happened, but I'm setting the time zone at the beginning. But I still, even after I log in, it's connected to my Wi-Fi, the time is still way off and I've had to go back into that time and date setting in order to make changes or else it's eight o'clock here, but it's telling me that it's 12 or something like that. Yeah, the accuracy of the time settings can be quite annoying because I know I've had more than one occasion where you'll have the time set even after install and all of a sudden you look down and it's like, why is this thing like six hours ahead of where I'm supposed to be? <laughs> I think what it is, is it's a conflict with like probably the motherboard internal clock, if I had to guess, but it yeah. doesn't make it any more or less annoying. Well, and the biggest frustration with that is you can't run an update sometimes. Sometimes, especially when I have some sort of repo pulled from somewhere else. If we go back to my Microsoft Surface Pro, in order to get the touchscreen to work, I have to use a specialty kernel. Well, to keep that specialty kernel update with the rest of the system, I actually pull an additional repo in from the people that make that specialty kernel. So when I do an update, it all gets updated together makes it pretty clean. The downside is if there's any issue between the time on my system and the time that it's supposed to be based on the world clock, then it won't update. It's telling me that there's a time issues and I have to go in and fix it. And on that particular system in general, the time seems to get out of sync more often. And I know that system is a little more weird anyway, just because it's a Microsoft Surface. But I haven't had any of those problems with my husband's Surface Book 3. It seems to happen more often on the Surface Pro 6. And it's a little annoying to be like, oh, the time's off and go in and fix that. But it is definitely one of the bugs, one of the issues in dealing with Plasma and some of those other repos for weird specialty hardware. As someone who, you know, runs weird specialty hardware, 
<laughs> for me, I've definitely seen that. Another thing that kind of irks me generically, and it's not as bad as it used to be, it's still a thing, depending on how the distro implements it, is Kitty Wallet. When I have to basically go in and disable the entire service just so it stops bugging the crap out of me. It's kind of like gnome <laughs> keyring on certain things. It's just like, I told you 15 times what this is. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, KDE wallet. I haven't had that issue for a long time, but the last time I did, it's always been on Kubuntu. I've never had that issue on Manjaro, and it just must be some way in their settings that they're changing things when they're putting the DE together for that specific distro. And it hasn't been the same across every single computer. So I could have same model. What was it? There was five computers there in class the first time that I did a computer class for co-op and every single one of them was running Kubuntu but out of the five systems there was only one that was annoying with wallet and it would pop up all the time it wouldn't let you start the internet it wouldn't let you do all kinds of things because it was constantly popping up and the worst part is it was the kid who was least equipped to deal with it was the one who had the system with the issue of course yeah, of yes. course the way i deal with it which is probably not recommended in fact I'm, i guarantee it's not recommended and it might suggest that security is not top of mind with me all the time which it should be but it's not i have it do the classic blowfish security and then i put no password it screams at me once basically tells me I'm an idiot. doesn't say that specifically, but basically says that. And then I say, okay, and then never bothers me again. It still stores the passwords in a less secure fashion, I guess, instead of the GPG. It does store the passwords and it also doesn't interfere with me ever again after I set it up that way. So maybe if the Plasma team were to make the more secure method less annoying, we could do that and be fine. But I don't want my desktop to annoy me. And so I'll just get rid of the annoying bits. And that's the one annoying bit that I got rid of. Now, I don't know if you guys have this problem. I, I like my retro machines, and so I do run emulators, especially on my newest computer, for fun. But one of the emulators seems to have an issue where it makes the compositor get all ropey after I try and use it. The Win, the, the UAE, not Win UAE, that's the Windows version. The Ultimate Amiga emulator, which used to be called the Unusable Amiga emulator. After I close the application out, I get like a three to five frames per second on Plasma unless I turn off compositor. I don't know what breaks in it. Restart Plasma shell. I cycle the compositor on and off. Still gives me problems. I don't know what the problem is unless I log out and log back in, I have issues with it. So that's the only other thing I would say that really grinds my gears, as it were, KDE gears. I don't know where the problem is. Maybe it's a, an open GL thing. Maybe it's a, you know, who knows what it is. Yeah. And it's had some issues in the past with other things. I haven't ran an NVIDIA card for a long time, so I don't know if it's still an issue. But I know with the NVIDIA graphics card, you could have some issues with the compositor where the icons will get this really weird look like they've come out of a inkjet printer with some of the nozzles that are disrupted or bad and the color's not great. It's all kind of liney and strange. Is that still an issue? Do you know? Or have they got that fixed? I don't run NVIDIA, so I can't say for sure. Yes, I, I can say I'm the only one that runs NVIDIA. Well, mostly. I know what you're talking about. Like the icons would get like this weird like blurriness to them. I haven't seen that recently, but I've been using a lot of distros that don't ship with like normal default plasma stuff. So like the RTX machine that I have that runs with KD on it is Garuda. So there's so much customization to that particular distro that I honestly haven't seen it. And that's on a 1920 by 1080, 144 hertz screen. So I haven't seen that kind of blurriness that you're mentioning, but I have seen it in the past. So one thing I do notice quite frequently, though, is I always love getting the, this is something I've noticed around Proton games, kind of Nate's similar made. The compositor had to reset after you exit like a Proton game based game. It's kind of weird, and I'm assuming it's because it's disabling certain things in the background because it needs to. Could be the flavor of the distro, but it is definitely something that is a thing, like Nate has mentioned. The compositor can get a little wonky from time to time. This episode of DLN Extend is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the passive manager we use and trust. It's the easiest, safest way for individuals, teams, businesses, and organizations to store their passwords and other vital sensitive information. Bitwarden lets you choose the authentication to access your password manager, such as PIN, master password, and adding phrases or fingerprint security, all to keep your passwords safe. Go to bitwarden.com dln to get started for free. 
Bitwarden is a password manager that I use and trust because Bitwarden is 100% open source. It has extensive security audits. It gives you the ability to self-host if you so choose. So go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. It's only $10 for a premium account, which gives you one gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F, Duo, Vault Health Reports, and more. Make the smart move, like many from the community have, and go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. If you're like me, you'll want to show your appreciation by signing up for the premium edition, especially since the premium edition starts at only $10 annually. Bitwarden has saved me from getting into a serious jam numerous times. Now, you wouldn't be able to pry it from my cold, dead device. Thanks to Bitwarden for sponsoring this episode of DLN Extend. Speaking of things getting all ropey and wonky, Nate, you were apparently doing some work on fixing some things that were broken and wonky. Yes, it was very wonky. I would actually use the term cattywampus. So a buddy of mine, he asked me to fix his laptop that he dropped. It's an HP Pavilion 15, really nice like metal case, whatever, you know, like metal structure, probably aluminum, I'm guessing, some sort of aluminum alloy. Well, he dropped it. Basically, he didn't close the case properly and it fell out on the concrete. So it totally crushed the HDMI port. It's gone forever and ever, unless you resolder a new connector on there. But basically, it looks like it had a really bad day. The power port survived, but it wouldn't turn on. We tried turning on, the power light would flash and it would just shut down. So he thought that the power connector was broken as well. So I took the whole thing apart, which HP does a nice job of some of the laptops being really easy to work on. Bravo HP for not being bad about that. I was going to use another word, but let's just use bad. As I pulled some parts out of it, a ribbon cable that goes into like one of those ZIF connectors, like latching ZIF connectors. They need to have like a little tool or your fingernail. You have fingernails to get it under there to release it. Well, it became cattywampus in there at an angle. The plan was I was going to take the board out and check all the solder joints. When I got this far, I thought, well, let me just correct that ZIF cable and see what happens. I reinserted it, plugged the thing in. All of a sudden, like lights came on. It was normal and bang, the whole laptop worked. I checked to make sure the port was okay. Like I kind of pulled the barrel connector out a little bit, messed with to make sure it wasn't flaky. Sure enough, thinking I was going to have to do this major soldering job, fix the power connector. It was just a cattywampus ribbon for the USB board connectors that came crazily undone out of the zip socket. I've never seen that before. I've never seen a zip give up a USB cable, but I've also never dropped a laptop before with that kind of impact. So who knows? It's working fine. He's using the laptop. He's very happy he got it back. But now he wants me to install something else on it. It's running Windows. So <laughs> I'm having a hard time wanting to help him with that piece of it. I'll tell you the hardware part, but I, ah, just, Windows is just so painful. Windows is painful. And it's amazing how finicky those ribbon cables can be sometimes. We had an issue with one when we first got this Xbox One. It showed up after being shipped and it was a little rat. Rattly. And so I didn't want to power it on until I figured out what the rattle was. And on it, there's the capacitive touch button on the front of the Xbox One. And in order to fully get the top off, you have to undo that ribbon cable and then to get it back together. And it was just a support that was down. Got that put back in. Not that big deal. You have to reseat that ribbon cable at this really awkward position in order to get it back on. I thought I had it fully secured and apparently I didn't because it would start powering on and off randomly, which was really weird. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what happened? Maybe I did something else wrong. Because when I had it apart, I went ahead and put fresh thermal paste on just to make sure, hey, we're going to be playing with it for a long time, all of that stuff. Let's just go ahead and take care of this so I've already got it open. So I thought I'd mess something up when it came to the thermal paste. Nope, got it back apart and realized that that ribbon cable wasn't fully seated properly. And that is what was causing our on and off issues. Amazing what a little uh, crossing conductors can do, huh? Yep. So I understand you have some game action going on with a strangely named game, Wendy? Yes. I dove back into the stuff that was available on my Humble Bundle Monthly, and I came across this game called Encodia. It looked a lot like a game I'd like to play with things like the inner world and candle it had some of that same graphical style it has some of that same game type play this is not an fps one of the most interesting things about this game is when they were making it when they were creating it using a crowdfunding source people got to pick different aspects of the game so if you're going through it there's a warning at the beginning of the game that says hey there's some names that may sound like people you know or that kind of thing. We love everybody. It doesn't matter. This was just some of the stuff that was picked by the community. Here you go. Enjoy the game. One of the things that got me to play it immediately was I claimed it and it's a GOG game and I've never installed a game from GOG 
Of course, I picked it because it had a Linux version. Downloaded the file, got it from GOG, and this was this super awesome click and install kind of thing. I haven't installed a game directly to the system from a downloaded game file in, well, since before I moved from Windows to Linux. It's always been through Steam. I've never played with Lutris, so yeah, I don't know anything about that, but it's definitely complicated in its own right. And it was so amazingly simple. And one of the things that I absolutely loved about the GOG installer is I could still choose where that game file goes. So I have different drives in my systems for different purposes. One of those drives is specifically devoted to games. I was able to save that game file directly to the hard drive that is there for games and it's not cluttering up my main drive. It's not messing with my media drives. It's exactly where I want it to go still. I know where that file is if I ever need to reinstall the main system. It's not going to mess with the games that I have that I installed there. The gameplay in this is definitely up my alley, as I mentioned before. If you've played the Inner World games, if you followed the fact that I love Candle, I've played it through a couple different times. It's that point-and-click adventure game. The graphics, I really love the way the graphics are done. And you get to switch back and forth between being the little girl and being her companion robot as you're trying to solve these different puzzles and work things out. Some things the little girl can do and some things she can't and you need the assistance of your robot, which is a ton of fun. He's really tall, much taller than her. Height-wise, there's stuff that he can get to that she can't. I loved this aspect of the second inner world where you were back and forth between different characters. Sometimes you were playing the main character. Sometimes you were playing the annoying little pigeon and just other characters in the game and it makes it an interesting more complex way to get things done. It's another one of those steps in your strategy or problem solving to figure out how to achieve the goal and move on to the next part. Yeah, it looks like a really fun game, Wendy. As far as GOG, I do really like the installer. You can specifically tell it where to install, especially in situations like you where you have like multiple drives or in my situation where I have the same thing. Now, if you want to manage your GOG games, may I make a recommendation for you? Yes. There's a open source client for specifically the GOG games that you own. And it's called Mini Galaxy. It allows you to use, say you have Windows games specifically in your library too. You can tell it to use Wine to try to play those games on top of managing. And the nice thing is like the Steam client where it gives you your library and you just click download and it downloads the game for you. If you want to change a lot of the preference, like where it installs and stuff, because I believe by default it's going to go to a GOG folder on whatever your primary home directory is. So, but you can change that. But it also allows you to keep the installers. So once you download like the installer and say you want to keep it in case you decide to you can pave the game or whatever off of your system, you you totally can do that. You can uninstall the games. There's over the artwork. There's a little icon. Uh, so just like a minus sign or a trash can. I can't remember the exact logo. You click that and it deletes it. That's a nice little client, totally open source. That does sound awesome. I'll have to check that out. I have a couple other GOG games. They're ones that I've gotten from emails that have popped up. Hey, you can get this one free. And I'm like, ah, it's free. I might as well claim it, but I haven't actually played them yet. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll go ahead and give that a try. That way, if I don't like the games, they're easy to still manage that way with the uninstall and all of that fun stuff. It'll be like an initial login for your GOG account. It is very much a, yes, another client to manage. If you want to have your DRM free games without having to potentially deal with the multi-stage downloads that sometimes if you just go to GOG directly and you're a Linux user because they don't always have the most everything rolled into one like they do on some of the Windows games and stuff. The best compromise to a GOG Galaxy on Linux right now, which is the GOG client that we have yet to see. Very awesome. Thanks for that suggestion. Your game is a lot different than my game, but I guess that's par for the course, right? We have very different tastes when it comes to games. 
I always thought we had very similar tastes in games. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> this game is actually up more Nate's alley because this is a vintage game, a vintage game series, and it's done in the style and all the other stuff of the vintage, but it has more modern gameplay and aesthetics and that kind of stuff. And that is Streets of Rage 4. The reason I want to highlight this game is because it's a very popular game, just going by specifically like the Steam stuff. I mean, it's only got over 11,000 reviews the overall feel is very positive that's pretty good for a game the thing that i love about this though is it's linux native so people who always clamor claim that uh, we don't always talk specifically about linux native games well here's a long time game series that after streets of rage 3 that everybody thought was dead they brought it back so this is a great 2d modern side scrolling beat em up I can honestly say I have no complaints about this game whatsoever. The fact that they went out of the way and made it Linux native is even, I know I might catch some flag for saying out of the way, but the fact that they made a Linux version for this game makes me want to support the devs that much more. If you clamor claim, you know, you want native games, here's one to go highlight because that's freaking amazing that they did that. And the gameplay is fun as heck. So if you've played any of the side scroll and beat em ups of the past, um, you know, your double dragons and those kind of games, this is very much in that wheelhouse of stuff. Obviously, some of the more modern takes are going to be in the art direction and specifically the movement is going to feel more smooth than anything else. But everything else, I totally feels like classic side scroll and beat them up to me it kind of brings back memories of being in an arcade and seeing a game like this sitting there waiting for someone to play i know i saw games like this before this definitely wasn't one around my house it can be used in the sega emulator from what i'm seeing in there where we also have some of the sonic games of course remember my daughter thinks we need to own every single version oh, speaking of that she just bought a new sonic game that's beside the point completely and totally off topic but i absolutely love that emulator if you haven't played in that before you have your groupings of cartridges for the Sega Genesis that you go like pick out and digitally put into the Sega. It's a ton of fun. I love the way that they've done that instead of you just having a screen where you're selecting which Sega Genesis game you're playing, you actually get to digitally put in the cartridge. It's a lot of fun. That's the thing I love about these type of games is it's a modern take on classics, but it doesn't throw out the classic part of it. It builds on the classic and updates it. Definitely get what you mean when it, like what you were mentioning with the emulators and stuff. That is something I really, really like. We'd like to continue the discussion with you on Telegram, in Discourse, Mumble, or Discord. Visit the DLN website for more information on how to connect to the social channels and all our shows and creators at DestinationLinux.network. And for more information on me, you can go to cubiclenate.com. Links to my regular written blatherings, podcast, and YouTube channel can be found there. You can follow my random ramblings on Twitter at MattDLN. You can find me on Mastodon at WendyDLN at Mastodon.online. Be sure to check out the DLN merch store. Grab yourself some awesome DLN extend swag along with stuff from across the network as always we thank you for joining us we'll be back next week with another awesome sode of deal and extend until then have a great week everyone keep recording nate but wendy dropped out oh dang I swear this episode's cursed this week. I'm going to take a picture and send it of my uh, plushie on my computer just so you have evidence against me because I think it's funny. You got to think it's funny too, right? The evidence against me. Well, yeah, that's what I was laughing at. I don't really think it's unhealthy, but I think it's funny that you think it's bad otherwise, I guess. It is totally unhealthy. There you go. Now you have evidence of my almost unhealthy obsession. Something tells me we're going to have to send them. Oh, that's going to be the garbage part. If we hang up, does she still get the files? Um, We have the locals, but... If not, we can just do local. We can keep going. It doesn't matter, but it's just one of those, like, uh, about yeah. to redo re the intro and stuff. I just want to make a mental note about timestamps and stuff. Yay! I see a Wendy again. I see a Wendy. Do I hear a Wendy, though? Mm -hmm. She's muted. I still show a limited connection on my internet, so I don't know how well it's actually going to work. I went from not being awake to not very happy. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> I told me I was like, this episode's cursed. Apparently, KDE doesn't want us talking about the things we don't like. Apparently.
It is angry. You use me all the time. Don't talk bad about me. You guys don't ever use good enough. You can talk about bad all you want. It's saying, I'm listening. Wendy, out of curiosity, because you're the one with the control panel for Riverside. <laughs> if we both leave and you're not the host anymore, like if you drop out, does it still keep going? Like, yeah, it still keeps recording. Okay. Because I'm assuming that it backs up to the whatever your, the Riverside account is or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So <laughs> shall we try this again or? We're just going to pick up where we left off. I can't open the ad. <laughs> oh, I was like, crap! Did my internet go out again? No, no. <laughs> I literally just have nothing to add.